on behalf of Lannan Foundation and the Office of Broadband Development, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to beautiful Nisswa, Minnesota and beautiful Grand Lodge. It's so good to see you here today. Thanks for coming. It's wonderful to be with you all and we're looking forward to three days of a lot of learning and good times together. The theme of our conference this year is innovation. We're going to focus on what it means to put broadband to work for healthy communities in education, healthcare, agriculture, with the aging, and in our business communities. As my colleague Bill Coleman is fond of saying, broadband infrastructure is like an exercise bike in your basement. You don't get any benefit from it unless you use it. And just like getting fit, putting broadband to work for communities in innovative ways doesn't happen by accident. It takes community effort, it takes dedication to reap the full benefits of high-speed broadband networks. And at this conference, we're gonna hear from people that are doing just that. We'll be celebrating the infrastructure successes and talk about how communities are using broadband to beat some of their biggest challenges, from jobs and economic development to community engagement and equity. We've teed up some sessions on a whole range of topics related to broadband access and use and pursuing broadband, some case studies of improved broadband to digital inclusion tools and strategies for engaging diverse audiences to examples of tech transformed agriculture, healthcare, and education. Providers are gonna discuss trends and deployments and offer advice to communities on how to partner better with them. We're gonna hear from an international panel of digital natives about how they decide where to work, live, and play. And there's gonna be some magic and dancing. <laughs> and along the way, we're gonna celebrate the courage and vision of some of the early pioneers in Minnesota's journey to border-to-border -border broadband with a number of courageous leadership awards. We'll be recognizing community leaders who over the last 15 years have led the way to better broadband here in Minnesota. The first of these awards will present at lunch today, and we're gonna make some tomorrow, and then we'll follow up with some final awards on Thursday. I'm really excited and really gratified that a number of special friends and colleagues of our Blandon team will be here with us at the conference to help us with these award presentations. We have an extraordinarily fine slate of talent on the program this anniversary year. Minnesotans are above average, of course, as we all know. And so most of the people on the conference agenda will be from Minnesota, but we've, you know, we've just got so much great stuff going on here in our state. But we also have are uh, really delighted to welcome to our conference some folks with riveting stories to share from further afield, from Washington, D.C., from Canada, and from Finland. I want to be sure in my introductory comments to um, acknowledge our sponsors, which I thought I had a slide for. You do. One more. Here we are. We couldn't do this alone. That's a big theme of, of Blanet Foundation that um, you got to do it yourself, but you can't do it alone. And uh, we really appreciate the, uh, the support um, and the partnership of these many sponsors who have made this conference possible. And in particular, I want to call out our Office of Broadband Development and the Department of D that have partnered with us these many years. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, the goals that we set for the conference. Um, we want to, first of all, I said our theme is innovation, and we want to be sure to unpack innovation. What is it? And what does it take for communities to be innovation incubators? We want to expose each of you to at least one actionable idea that you can bring back to your community and an aspirational idea too. We want to help you feel empowered to make informed decisions about technology and partners. We want to demonstrate the role of broadband adoption in economic development as well as the public return on investment in broadband infrastructure. And finally, we're going to be recognizing and celebrating leaders among us. We hope that in the next few days, we'll help us together collectively see and celebrate the 15 years of collaboration that have produced these results. And perhaps most importantly, we want to underscore the urgency of addressing the gaps we're facing between 
where we are and our 2026 goals as a state. We still have a lot of work to do to meet our 2026 goals and we've got to keep going. And so these next few days are a lot about giving us all the juice that we need to keep going. And we hope everybody will feel challenged, encouraged, and inspired. And here now to share a few words of welcome and, to, and encouragement is our conference planning partner and co-sponsor, Angie Dickinson of the Office of uh, State Office of Broadband Development. Minnesota is so lucky to have Angie back from Wisconsin. I'm personally grateful to her, to you, Angie, and to the office, uh, her colleagues, uh, Diane Wells and others of her colleagues at the office for their assistance in planning the conference. We're really proud to have the Office of Rapid Development as a sponsor. So please help me welcome Angie Dickinson. $70 million. And just to imagine it, we have $20 million in available funding. We received 80 applications. Our team has a really, really tough decision to make over the coming months. Um, we expect to make an announcement about those grant awards by the end of the year. Uh, we were fortunate in our last budget. We have $20 million for 2019. We have another $20 million for 2020. So I'm encouraging folks if you didn't have the opportunity to get an application in in this 2019 grant round, it's not too soon to start planning your projects for next year. And today is a wonderful day to start those conversations with experienced folks in the room. Uh, lastly, I want to share with you, so we have we have two major priorities, right? We want to, we want to get the broadband infrastructure into the communities that are lacking coverage today. That's our highest priority. It's why, why we all started the work that we're doing. The other, the other piece of that is thanks to private and public investment, we have rural communities with some of the best infrastructure in the country. And let's start using that infrastructure as an economic development tool and delivering on that hope and promise of that investment. So that's what I also love about the, te the uh, theme that the Blanded folks picked for this year's conference. Let's put broad, broadband to work. Let's make this infrastructure work for our communities, work for our children. Let's use it as an economic development tool and we're excited to help folks start thinking about that infrastructure in that way. And lastly, I just want to thank you all for being here. I look forward to learning from you and hearing your stories and bringing those stories back to St. Paul with we continue our work together to help Minnesota reach its border to border goals. So now it's my privilege to introduce Mr. Bill Coleman, who will introduce our next speaker. Have a good, good week, everyone.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. John Young is a professional, award-winning urban planner, urban designer, economic developer, author, visiting professor, and global speaker on planning, economic development, especially related to smart cities and intelligent communities. John's a pioneer in the smart city movement, having worked in it since the early 1980s. You can see his full biography in the program. I met John more than a, a decade ago through my initial work using the Intelligent Community Framework in Dakota County. He's always been thoughtful and generous in his advice to me and my community work. Dakota County made the Smart 21 community list three years running. We could never move up into the rankings because we failed to move from collecting good stories to intentionally using the framework as a community organizing tool. I've been a fan of the framework ever since, for communities large and small. Using the framework has several benefits, most of all linking community technology initiatives to community development goals and cementing community collaboration. The framework has been essential to our Minnesota Intelligent Rural Communities and Bland and Broadband Communities programs over the last decade. John is a true thought leader when it comes to creating strategies to help communities thrive. I'm so pleased that he was able to join us here in Minnesota today and tomorrow. I encourage you to take every opportunity you can to hear from John. Uh, I welcome our neighbor to the north from the great city of Toronto, John Young. in this kind of environment. I was able to walk down to the beach last night and take a picture of the sunset. Uh, that, that kind of uh, really makes me feel wonderful and I hope you take advantage of this, this particular area. I think it's a, a great community, a great region, and a great state. Uh, we've learned a lot from all the people who have applied for the Intelligent Community Forum in the past. And, uh, what we're looking for is engaging you a little bit more moving forward. So, let's get started. How many of you have been to Europe, particularly to London, England, and uh, gone to uh, use the tube and heard, let's see if this works, there we go, heard them say, mind the gap. How many? Let's see, let's see your hands. All right, so there's quite a few of you who've experienced that. Um, when I'm there and I hear that, it, it always lets me know that there are communities out there that really have not taken advantage of the fact that they need to mind the gap. Just like some of the people who, you know, trip over that big opening and fall on the platform. You see that from time to time, particularly backpackers who aren't minding the gap. Uh, if you mind the gap, you actually wind on and wind up onto a platform that is best way for you to experience London. Well, if I can leave you with a thought at the end of all of this, it's you should mind the gaps that are in your community so that you can work towards improving them. That you can then get onto a platform, that you can engage the community in order to move up into a better, high quality life for you and your, your citizens in the community that you're in. And so I'm using this theme throughout, and you'll see a couple of places where I'd like to talk a little bit more about minding a gap. But before I do that, let me just talk a little bit about the Intelligent Community Forum. Uh, how many of you here are familiar with uh, the Intelligent Community Forum? Okay, some of you aren't. So let me explain a little bit. The Intelligent Community Forum uh, was created actually in the 1980s. Uh, people think that something called a smart city is relatively new. Uh, you might see that term uh, when you uh, find a tweet talking about smart communities or smart cities. Uh, we started off as a smart city uh, association back in the 1980s looking at technology
technology and how it can uh, create better communities. I'm an urban planner and I was dealing with a lot of science in cities uh, with teleports, the uh, uh, high-speed broadband that came over satellites into communities, some to a cable head and then it allowed people to watch their soccer game from England here in North America. Uh, but what could it do for a community? Now, we started asking the questions when we toured various places around the world where they were beginning to get teleports in. And what they were able to do, sorry. Okay, you're not seeing my private message. <laughs> so I have had my wife call me in the middle of a speech, and I have to. Okay, I, I have a little uh, uh, timer here that tells me how long I'm speaking, so that's what that's about. The um, uh, back in the 1980s, we looked at communities and we said, how can we be helpful? And so we created a Smart Cities Association. And uh, through that, we held the first Smart Cities Conference in 1995. Uh, planners, architects, city leaders, many others came together. We had 1,200 people at this first event. And out of it, people said, well, you really need to take, take this global. Uh, unfortunately, where we were, uh, we couldn't get people's attention to put some resources behind it. So, we wound up in New York City where uh, the city's economic development department said, yeah, come on in and we'll support you. They didn't give us any money, but at least they gave us the opportunity to start going global with uh, some, some uh, facilities and uh, support at the economic development level. And slowly but surely, working with the World Trade Centers Association and this uh, World Teleport Association, we formed what eventually has become the Intelligent and over the years, uh, we've done a few things. First of all, uh, we started off as a think tank, coming up with ideas around well, what does this all mean, and defining what a smart city is, and eventually what an intelligent community is. We'll talk a bit about that as we go on. And then people said, oh, we, we need to uh, have great examples. So we started an awards program, and uh, some of you have applied to that awards program. Well, that awards program has been now going on for over two decades. Well, for us, that awards program is not about just simply saying, hey, look at who's out there. For us, it's data. Uh, over two decades ago, we realized that data is the new oil, and we needed to refine it. We needed to figure out and you know, bring it up the chain to not only become data, but also then information and eventually insights. And from that, we've been able to undertake a number of books and, and research papers and so forth. But uh, in addition, we started to uh, create an association once we had all of these awards. Uh, the president of Taiwan said to us, after about 30 cities that we started to recognize, you've got a tiger by the tail here. You should actually create an association. That took a, took a little bit of time, but we eventually did. <coughs> we eventually did um, association and from the association we formed uh, a number of institutes around the world um, and now also what we call ICF nations uh, we have a number of them as well so you know our, our depth has grown uh, considerably and we undertake a number of events throughout the year uh, we go and speak at uh, conferences like this but we also hold our own conferences and we undertake a number of initiatives as you can see here we have the awards, we do books, uh, we have the, uh, you know, the various events, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those events later. But the most important thing for us is how we have developed a global recognition of cities around the world that, from a best practices point of view, gives us and others the opportunity to learn about what they're doing in their communities and those parts of the countries that they're in. And those communities are showcasing their best practices, not only at the local level for others to see and maybe be inspired by, but also we use those to provide information and benchmarking for other communities. And that aspirational piece is very, very important. That some of these communities that apply every year, hundreds apply, but we're only picking 21 a year 
to uh, work with. Uh, those 21 eventually become what we call the top seven because we do more data diving into it more deeply. And then eventually we use one of them uh, through an awards process at the end of the year as the best model for either the theme or uh, the uh, uh, just because they're outstanding communities and then we're able to showcase them. And people are able to see the gaps that they have in comparison to those communities. And that's the mind the gap piece. If you can figure out, having received maybe a report card from us or some kind of a benchmarking report that says, here's how you stand against these 21 communities or these top seven communities, or you know, our global list of 200 so-called uh, intelligent communities, they can give you that information. And then it's really up to you to figure out what you're going to do with that information. Are you gonna let that gap exist? Or are you gonna fix that gap and make sure that you arrive at the right platform and that your community is able to benefit as a result? So that's part of the process. But there's also another reason why we are doing this work. Over the years, we've recognized uh, a number of communities that then not only show us best practices, here's the top seven for the past year. Uh, we can see them from, from a variety of uh, areas. But there's, a, there's another reason, and for me, it's very important. There are some huge challenges there are huge disruptions taking place in the world. Um, I think these four disruptions are, are critical ones. And maybe, maybe you'll, uh, through the Q&A session afterwards, you might want to talk about these as well. But these 200 communities, they tell, help to tell us how they're dealing with these disruptions. So what are these disruptions? Let's start with the first one. So globalization. There are many communities that are being impacted by either social or political or cultural issues through globalization. Uh, if you look at the Detroit-Windsor uh, border, products and services go back and forth so many times as part of trading mechanisms, and it's part of the global chain. There are products like Nike and others that are produced all over the world and that globalization continues, what does that have as an impact at the local level? Or can that be changed with maybe 3D printing at the local level? So there are these issues that people have to look at as part of the globalization. Another one is climate change. Climate change is a, has a huge impact on your community, but it's gonna be very costly to rectify this, to make sure that we stay within the 1.5 for us to, to target. That's a very expensive uh, undertaking. However, it's also possible to create entirely new business models that can then benefit from that uh, climate change uh, solution. And there are communities all over, those 200 communities and more, because we actually touch over a thousand over the years, that have created solutions that people can share or they might franchise, or they might be able to provide in some fashion uh, to your community as part of, part of the process of getting to know them through networking and so forth. So those solutions exist out there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel to be able to take advantage of them. There's a huge economic opportunity as part of this particular issue. Another one is urbanization. By 2050, we're supposed to see many cities around the world uh, capture almost two-thirds of the population of the globe. We already are watching how mega cities, those are defined as having 10 million people or more, how they're growing. Only a handful recently in the last past couple of years, now all of a sudden uh, a lot of these communities are beginning to change their boundaries and create huge urban areas where they feel that there could be more efficiency by being larger places like Shanghai now growing to over 100 million people if you change those boundaries. But also, what does that do in terms of urban intensification? What, what happens as a result of that? And the kinds of changes that take place as part of the urbanization um, 
piece is going to be significant, it also will impact rural areas. People will start to go into those urban areas more and more looking for jobs and taking advantage of uh, things that they can do in those areas that they can't do in some of the rural areas. However, we have examples of rural communities where they have taken advantage of particularly broadband applications and have been able to bring home a lot of the people who have moved away and come back as families as a result because broadband gives them, just like education, a level or two opportunities, for, particularly for business and uh, for entertainment and other things like that. So urbanization is going to be a big factor as part of this and is a useful indicator for us about what's going on in, in many of these cities. And finally, technological disruption. Digital disruption is taking place and a lot of jobs are changing. You've probably read about it or heard about it in one form or another, but here's a list and I'm not sure if you can see it, but here are some of the 10 uh, jobs that are changing, financial services, areas related to education, uh, how food is being distributed and produced and so forth. All of these are going to be impacted through technological change, good or sometimes good or not so good. And so we'll, we'll have a, a really good look at all, all of these. And the key thing about the communities that we deal with is that these smart cities or intelligent communities are also sharing communities. We find that a lot of these communities are able to share the information or share the solution uh, to others. They might charge, but uh, in some cases they also give away their, their information for free. And we have a number of websites, one uh, that we work with in Germany called Be Smart City that now has, I think, something of like about six or eight hundred solutions that you can download and, and connect with. Uh, we provide networking capabilities so that there's a solution that you need in your community, well, you can mine that gap and, and particularly uh, fill it by talking to some of the people that we have as part of our network. So there's some key trends that are happening. Obviously, you've heard of uh, artificial intelligence, and <coughs> autonomous vehicles, and the Internet of Things, and so forth. These are things that are current and, and timely, and we should be aware of those trends. However, there's an underlying current I think we'll talk a little bit about that later. Particularly things like uh, digital equity and the concepts behind ethics and the need for us to be much more aware of our um, capabilities around uh, using the data that we have access to or that cities are now claiming they're able to bring together. We have an example later on of a huge one that Google's involved in in Toronto they are uh, looking at creating whole new communities based on attracting data uh, from everything that people do in that new community. And that's raising uh, the scepter of you know, what, do we, what do we do with our privacy in this case and how do we protect it. Another one that you should be aware of is the future based on quantum computing. And that is going to be a very serious should I speak closer? Okay. Hello? Okay. <laughs> uh, so quantum computing will be a very important element for everybody to watch, particularly if we don't have solutions to anyone who takes advantage of hacking using quantum computing technologies. Uh, we have research that's underway uh, that's supported to take a look at how quantum computing will impact us. It'll be good on one hand, uh, help us move the yardstick further in terms of healthcare and, and many other solutions that are out there. On the other hand, uh, if we have the undercurrent of uh, um, undesirables who get a hold of the quantum computing before the good guys get it, we're in trouble. And that research is underway right now. And uh, if any of you are interested in that particular storyline, I can guide you to the Research. So, good stories and bad stories out there in terms of trends for tomorrow. So at ICF, the Intelligent Community Forum, we've come up with a particular framework. Uh, we call it the ICF methodology, basically, 
for how communities should take a look at uh, creating better high quality communities for their citizens. And we talk about turning smart cities into intelligent communities. Well, there are a lot of communities that, first of all, aren't even aware that they're a smart community. And we've helped some of those communities undertake uh, a process of um, uh, delivering at the local level an understanding of what a smart community is. We define a smart community, basically, or a smart city, as those that uh, focus on becoming efficient and cost-effective communities that decision makers are able to use the data derived from uh, you know, many of the broadband enabled sensors and other kind of monitoring equipment to give direction uh, in their community so that those efficient and cost effective capabilities are going to create that smart, uh, uh, smart community. On the other hand, what we think should take place is you take that smart infrastructure that is efficient and cost effective good decision making based on sort of the evidence based data that you have and now take it to another level, a completely different level or a series of levels and the first one is talent, attraction, creation and retention. If you have smart people and you have smart infrastructure, well then the next one is you can create an innovation ecosystem and with the innovation ecosystem that's where prosperity starts. That's where you're actually able to gain in a community, either through startups creating uh, new products and services, apps based on some of the open data that's available from the smart city data that, that, that is created, or uh, you can create an ecosystem that nurtures and attracts foreign direct investment, that knows that your community has all of the uh, pieces of the puzzle that they need for investment ready development. High-speed broadband is a key component of that, but so is other elements of the uh, smart infrastructure. Once you have those elements, then you know you have the prosperity to undertake strategies for sustainability, for resiliency, the ability to be agile in your community to respond to some of those disruptions that I talked about earlier. Uh, it's important to have those strategies, of course, but you also need to look at ways in which you can bring everybody to the table as part of that. We call that digital equity. We used to call it digital democracy. Uh, you know, the opportunities around, uh, sorry about that, I'm connected here. Uh, digital democracy only talks about uh, the haves and the have-nots. But we also want to talk about the opportunities of bringing everybody up in this high-quality space, but also in a fair, ethical way, being transparent to being what we call an open smart community or an open intelligent community. So that's a very important piece and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. And finally, a couple of other areas. Um, we talk about advocacy and good governance. Public policies are very important uh, to support the intelligent community movement, but uh, you also need the community to be empowered. You need to have citizenship engagement right from the beginning. You need that buy-in. You need the champion who is supported at the community level as well. And at the end of the day, it has to be a collaborative community all the way around. And this is a virtuous cycle that just continues and always improves. So as this framework moves forward, and we'll just have little bits and pieces of this information moving forward, uh, I think this is the essence for us creating a good, intelligent community. So let's just see if we can get this uh, little video to work here. Maybe you have to touch that. Give it a click. Although the smart city concept has been around for more than two decades, thanks to significant marketing investments by major technology vendors a decade ago, Governments around the world have become attracted to its promise to help solve their increasingly complex and costly urban problems. Under the name Smart Cities, the notion that data-driven, evidence-based decision-making will make their cities more efficient, secure, convenient, and cost-effective, city governments and technology vendors have deployed sensors, routers, meters, and monitors 
to optimize and predict the best outcomes for their cities. In essence, smart city efforts make cities work better. They apply information and communications technology to accurately monitor, measure, and control city processes, from the punctuality of transit services to the quality of the air and water supplies, and from the security of bridge construction to the performance of electric grids. Smart cities are about saving money, becoming more efficient, and delivering better service to the taxpayer. But connected smart infrastructure is only a piece of the urban puzzle. Science and technology needs to be balanced with creative people, opportunities to educate society to fill the ever-changing skills gap, and involve everyone in the community to ensure social inclusion and digital equality. We call these intelligent communities, as our communities will be disrupted with new applications ranging from autonomous vehicles and artificial intelligence to the Internet of Things and impact of the blockchain. It will be increasingly important to look holistically at our urban planning and community development processes. People must be at the heart of these decisions, leading, championing, and aspiring their communities to become vibrant, sustainable, and brilliant cities that will attract and sustain talent, jobs, and investment. In essence, intelligent communities are different from smart cities. Intelligent communities adopt technology, but do not make it their focus. They take the longer view to make their communities better, whether they are large urban centers or smaller rural towns and villages, where citizens of all ages and employers thrive and prosper in the broadband economy. Every intelligent community has smart city projects underway. But many smart cities, limiting themselves to the immediate efficiency and cost benefits of ICT, have yet to take the first steps toward becoming intelligent communities. But it's not too late for them to do so. And by doing so, they can join a growing global family of intelligent communities. So those of you who have applied this year to become one of the recognized Smart 21 communities may recognize these words instead. We've gone from talking about broadband and, and so forth to now talking about connecting uh, to sustaining, to including, to engaging. These kinds of more positive action words are beginning to resonate in some of the communities we, we've been traveling to. And so you'll probably go in that route and, and instead of the kind of words that we've been using up to date. But let's go back to the original word. So from a broadband point of view, it's also focusing on the whole sort of smart city infrastructure piece. And that includes everything, roads, rail, uh, airports, seaports. But now there's a fifth element there in, in transportation, ubiquitous broadband. There are many communities that are beginning to see that you know, people are able to actually do work uh, in communities um, that don't have to be in urban centers. We have a, a study that was done by the, uh, the Knight Foundation years ago that talked about the essence of having, a, having people be sticky in a, in a community. Stickiness is basically uh, trying to either attract, create, or retain people in their, in their communities. And the Knight Foundation was asking the basic question, well, why are we losing people in some of the communities where our night, night uh, 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 newspaper chains were, 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 were uh, located? And they found besides the issue of you know, getting a job, there were three things that were partly responsible for keeping or attracting people. One was affordable housing, one was good mobility, transportation. And the third thing, it's obvious to you when you hear it, but a lot of people don't talk about it, and it's things to do. And a lot of kids, particularly, will leave because in a community they might have housing, they may have uh, easy transportation, they might get a job, but if there's a lack of things to do, they're going to move into those big urban centers and contribute to that urbanization. So strategies for things to do in small and medium-sized communities is a very important part of creating the kind of high-quality communities that, that are there. And smart infrastructure, particularly broadband, 
helps to enable that to happen. There are many different ways to do it. I'm not going to go into the details this slide, and you'll have access to this uh, slide presentation. But it shows that there are so many different ways through uh, to enable a broadband to happen in a community. But more importantly is once you have broadband, so what? What are you actually going to do with it? Well, here's a little list of opportunities to think about. So first of all, uh, there's health care, there's improved mobility that can, can happen as a result of it, uh, opportunities for education, for developing the data so that you can have open data to develop some entrepreneurial apps and so forth, uh, the, uh, uh, opportunities to attract foreign direct investment or have homegrown uh, businesses occur as a result of that, that innovation ecosystem we talked about earlier, and improve public engagement. Using broadband as a vehicle for communicating your ideas, your, your responses, your, your empowerment to do things in a community is very important as part of engaging uh, what you have in your community as part of the broadband piece. There's a lot of competitive advantages that you also can use to market to the rest of the world to let them know that you're investment ready. A lot of people who are looking to provide business opportunities they need to know that you have access to broadband. They need to know that you have the kinds of things that they're looking for. Well, you need really good websites. You need to have, engage in activities at the local level that they can participate in and so forth. So it's a really important piece. Broadband only provides you the wire or the wireless capabilities. It's you, the people, that actually make the rest happen. And that's the important ingredient. That, that's part of that minding the gap piece. Yes, you can have the infrastructure, but the rest of it is all about people. Here's an example. Uh, we're in Brainerd area, and uh, you know, here's a fiber initiative that has, has been created over the years, and it's doing sort of you know, good things with, with its broadband. Uh, but uh, here's, here's sort of a couple of quick quotes from, from an application that they Sorry, I'm going to leave this. Uh, while the more rural areas of the uh, BLA were served by telephone cooperatives, uh, their ability to expand their broadband services was limited by the lack of available middle mile infrastructure. Uh, the construction costs to get close to these prospective customers destroyed the business case for service area expansion. Nevertheless, uh, they were able to develop through their CTC a fiber system that is now 50 miles or even more. And the public sector got involved and owns a significant part of that network. And they participate in sort of a public-private uh, environment. And uh, clearly the, the area is serving the area needs, so they've got broadband here. And they're now able to actually innovate using different types of opportunities through their economic development department and are targeting the kinds of businesses that uh, would make sense for their community. Workforce development, innovation, and they're using it for, for marketing purposes. And they're including key word here, branding, as part of their initiative, uh, saying that they're basically tech ready or that they're investment ready. Very important. Uh, in terms of the next stage, about talent and you know, how important it is to keep that talent. If you're creating it locally, make sure that you're able to keep it. But if you don't have it, you need to attract it. And then you have to have that Knight Foundation methodology of keeping it. People have feet, they can leave. And you want them to be part of it because they're going to help create your innovation in your community or your innovation ecosystem as part of it. <coughs> And there are, are many methods to do that. Again, here is a public-private process, or Triple P, where you also include uh, nonprofits and, and, uh, and other uh, organizations to be part of it. But the academia needs to be part of it. Uh, the government needs to be part of it, but also the private sector. And innovation doesn't always have to have the use of broadband. Sometimes the innovation is just how people do things differently, 
knowing that they have access to broadband, knowing that they have access to smart city infrastructure. Well, in this case, this is Brainerd, they were you know, trying to develop the uh, tech firms as they were growing, but they were having a problem. One of the problems was keeping and attracting or retaining these talented individuals. And so what they needed to do is to figure out a, a way of approaching uh, talent to come to their communities. Now, one of the ways was to let them know about the competitive salaries that they had in their community and the high quality of life that they were developing. They needed to get out there through recruiters or websites and other things. They developed a key recruitment program. Now, that was people undertaking that initiative. That wasn't just broadband making it available. It needed the talent of the individuals to come together and come up with an innovative approach. And as a result, they were able to uh, uh, develop through working together to attract the kinds of people through this key recruitment program. That just shows you, gives you a, a sense of an idea of how, how innovation needs not only the infrastructure, but it needs the people to be able to make it work. And then you need the rest of the community to get behind it as well. Now, being a fair, and equitable, and ethical community, we need to not only bring everybody on board, but we also need to know that what we're doing with uh, the information that we're creating as a result of the data that we might get is that we're ensuring that people are able to maintain their privacy, they're able to retain their, their identities, and that uh, we're not being put into a situation where our communities are being challenged by, uh, by others out there who might want to undermine it. And so digital uh, inclusion and digital efficacy is very important as, as part of our, our communi communities moving forward. And I, I mentioned sustainability before and advocacy. I'm going to go beyond those right now and um, start talking about some examples. So we're going to, the rest of this program is all about examples. One of the examples is one of your nearby uh, states, Ohio, that has uh, Columbus, that was one of our Intelligent Communities of the Year. Having gone through our program, they recognized that it was more than just broadband and the smart city infrastructure that was going to potentially win them a uh, Department of Transportation Smart Cities Challenge. And what differentiated them from all of the other 79 applicants was the fact that they included this digital inclusion piece. They recognized the importance of uh, how broadband and, and, and the technologies of the day were actually going to create a better quality of life and put that into their application. And they won this DOT award uh, the following year after they uh, won our intelligent community award. They got $40 million DOT and then it was matched and today they are a 500 million dollar project piloting things like autonomous vehicles and uh, other things in their community and as part of the evolution of, of uh, Columbus we're going to next year see the, 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 the improvements uh, since our visit there in uh, 2015 and we're going to actually see five years later uh, how they've, uh, they've, they've improved there in Dublin, Ohio, their, one of their suburbs. Let's see uh, another example. Could you please click on that? Uh, it's a little town called Olds, Alberta. The Olds Institute for Community and Regional Development evolved out of a committee that was formed to support the town manager, who did economic development for the community at the time. The function of the Olds Institute was to grow and develop the community in a sustainable way. It has been 13 years since the Olds Institute was conceived. The organization has grown from a few volunteers and a seed of an idea into an organization with 10 standing committees two operating businesses, and 150 volunteers. Our business models fund a large portion of the work that we do, 
They enable us to be fully sustainable and give back to the community as well. Bonaire has been a tremendous opportunity that we are realizing in the community. It's an opportunity that others will realize in the future as well. We are attracting new businesses and making those who operate here more competitive. Both the Olds Institute and the Olds Connected Community Network were designed with a goal or a function in mind. This functional architecture continues to empower and be a catalyst for our sustainable future. When community members buy into the subscription of services from OMED, they are supporting the Olds Institute, supporting the many volunteers and community members who have a passion or a vision for a better tomorrow. The dollars and cents that come from these operations help afford us the opportunities that we will realize in the future. In 2004, the community of Olds and the Olds Institute for Community and Region Development were thinking about economic development and how it was impacting the way people lived, worked and played in our town. One concern we focused on was an accelerating brain drain in as the community's most talented young people were leaving in search of opportunity. The Olds community directed the Institute to explore the options of connecting to Alberta's Supernet, which at that time was being built across the province and the Institute saw this as a tool to maintain the town's status as a vibrant entrepreneurial community. From that direction, ONET was born. ONET is 100% owned and operated by the Olds Institute, representing and responsive to the needs of the Olds community. The network is Canada's first community-owned and community-based fiber utility infrastructure. Our network has been designed to be profitable and repay our debt at a 30% take rate. We feel this is conservative and replicable in other communities, and we are prepared to share our story with any community in the province and help them to build their own fiber project. Starting three years ago, we completed our first connection to a customer. Last summer, ONET introduced its one gig bandwidth service and has since been ranked as the having Canada's fastest internet speed. The community conversation has changed from I'm not sure to you have to connect to ONET. We have seen a stabilization in our businesses, seen some new businesses in the community directly attributed to the network, and a sense of ownership for the network is beginning to happen. We have had numerous other communities watching activities with interest, and some are carefully planning on how to do this for themselves. The community is slowly turning into a tech-savvy population, starting with businesses and at the school and at the college. This community continues to learn in technology, and I don't think it will ever end. Thank you for listening to our story. Okay. Olds, 9,000 people, uh, 1,500 students at the Olds College. It's a farming college. They teach you how to brew beer and, and other things as well. Uh, but. Uh, one of the key things is they developed a smart farming program based on the fact that they have this capability of some of the best broadband in the, in the province. We were there last, uh, sorry, in May, and we did a workshop. One thing we found disappointing is that there wasn't a lot of take up at the local community. Uh, there was clearly, uh, they have the best gigabit environment up and down, asynchronous capabilities, but nobody was using it. Some of the businesses would take advantage of it, but the residents were taking advantage of it. Some of the people in the university were taking advantage of it to get into the smart farming program. But that's about it. And they realized that they needed to develop a strategy of how to use the broadband in their community. So Mitch Thompson, who's their head of ODAT, is now working very hard to develop a strategy after several years of that kind of investment to employ uh, the kinds of activity that's necessary to take advantage of broadband in their community. They built it, but they built it expecting people will come and use it. They didn't actually have a program behind it to support it and to, to, to make it happen. So we're now giving them some advice on, on doing that. There are a couple of other places that have taken 
place at the same time while they were building the program. In Stratford, Ontario, let's see, go to the next one. Uh, let's just see what the Jenny DeBingo has to say first, and then I'll talk about it. Go ahead. My name is Jenny DeBingo, and I'm the executive director of the digital media program. I spent 25 years in Bell Canada and then did uh, five years in a high-tech startup in the Toronto area in telecommunications and then uh, was the dean of the business school at uh, the uh, Laurier, Wilfrid Laurier University for five years and now I'm uh, kicking off this program here and starting really to try to figure out how we can take digital media so taking the fabulous background that that University of Waterloo has on the technology side, blend that with an artistic background, add a side order of business, and turn that into some substantial economic development here in Stratford. So the reason that the university ended up here in Stratford is really twofold. The first and most important thing is the terrific reputation that Stratford has in and around cultural diversity. So commensurate with the reputation the University of Waterloo has on the technology side. So the two together really is a no-brainer. The other part, of course, is Dan Matheson, our mayor, um, an energy source in and of himself. And it was he, together with uh, David Johnson, now our Governor General, and the province of Ontario, and the city of Stratford themselves, that all came together through money and resources in a pot, and this is now the result. Um, I was actually not with uh, the University of Waterloo during the, the nascent stages, but uh, sitting across the street as the Dean of Business at, at Laurier, I certainly saw and heard the buzz around what was going on in Stratford. Um, having been brought in now to, to really develop this from the ground up, the, the parts are many fold. First is to develop uh, an interesting program that students will actually be compelled to sign up. Um, second is to amass a, a teaching uh, contingent that will bring prestige to the, to the group and also to kick off a research program. And then third and most I guess importantly looking around here is to actually put the actual facility together and, and worry about everything from student services through the security and, and uh, um, I guess student living. So I've been um, early 2000s, uh, the mayor uh, attended one of our conferences, heard what was going on in other provinces, particularly places like Fredericton and and uh, Moncton and, and, and places like that, smaller communities that were beginning to take advantage of this platform uh, and framework called the Intelligent Community um, Methodology. And what they did was say, we can do that. And the mayor took it back and formed an Intelligent Community Task Force, uh, working with their utility, they were able to build a their own broadband capabilities. Uh, uh, they started to attract a data center and they were able then to work with their festival. They have a Shakespearean festival there to figure out ways in which to create year-round employment. This was a big deal because they had seasonal employment. They didn't have too much year-round employment. And now they are not only a pilot for autonomous vehicles because they've, uh, they've created uh, ubiquitous Wi-Fi everywhere in their community. Uh, they've been able to uh, attract a lot of other pilots uh, that, that take place. And there are only 32,000 people in that community, and yet one of the best models that we take around the world. Um, one of the key takeaways for this one is ch the champions. Not only Ginny coming in from the outside to help create this fantastic media school, but the mayor and the council and many of the other community members who were part of, of this sort of intelligent Stratford were able to take it to another level very quickly by making some very key decisions, not only based on broadband, but also based on the fact that 
uh, they were beginning to get evidence-based information about their community to make those decisions. But then you need a champion and a community to support it. And finally, I'd like to show you a little example of something from down under. We've been named in Intelligent Community allows the Sunshine Coast to use that increased profile to highlight the benefits of being on the Sunshine Coast, whether it's in business, community, education, highlights the fact that we are stepping over and above what would be the normal practice around the world with regards to embracing technology that opens up a great future, in particular for our youth for education, but in particular for startups, entrepreneurs and businesses that rely on the digital technological world to make their business even better than what it is today. Congratulations, Sunshine Coast. We made it to the top seven. At Helipod's, our team of amazing people are constantly leveraging new technologies to deliver world-leading innovation. What a great time to be here on the Sunshine Coast. From everyone here at NTAG, congratulations, Sunshine Coast community, top seven in the world, smart city. What an amazing achievement. NTAG is really excited about how we are able to contribute right here at the Sunshine Coast, reaching out across Australia, providing digital transformation. We're proud to be part of Smart 21 communities where there are over 83,000 learners in universities and schools. We offer over 130 degrees for nearly 20,000 students. We're passionate about the impact in our research, learning and teaching for our communities. And that includes startup weekends, maker spaces, health accelerators, the University Innovation Centre, hackathons, Coda Dojos and STEM Connect. So congratulations Sunshine Coast, we've made it to the top seven. It's great to see that Sunshine Coast becoming renowned across the country but also across the world now as a digital location to, to come as a business and for parents to relocate their students if they want to be at the top of the pile in, in technology in the future. Sunshine Coast is offering a platform that I would consider so amazing with um, such open futures for any students and families wanting to be here. And just the exposure to industries is giving them connections that in a few years ago you wouldn't have been able to make and now they're taking these young students seriously because they are top of the game. The Sunshine Coast has a lot of opportunities. I've been able to reach out and extend my knowledge with mentors and all the different programs that the Sunshine Coast has to offer. There's so many great STEM hotspots around the Sunshine Coast to learn from. Congratulations Sunshine Coast, we made it to the top seven. So the Sunshine Coast is made up of 35 communities. Most of them are really, really small communities. Uh, I think the largest is maybe about 10,000 people. Uh, Calundra, where I spoke as part of this, uh, showed to me that these are communities that were not only engaged uh, individually, but collectively they brought together a lot of spirit and a lot of support for uh, their new mayor. Uh, uh, you saw on the, on the screen. Uh, the, the whole community embraced their intelligent community directions. Uh, this is a really important takeaway that it's not just about putting the broadband in as they did, but then engaging the community at all levels. You heard from the educational side, from the libraries, from, from uh, many of the other aspects of the community to actually build their program around what they needed. Now one of the things that they needed was to promote their region as a, a terrific place for investment. And now foreign direct investment is coming to them. They have a little gift. They've just put an undersea cable right into their community. Uh, and that undersea uh, cable is going to open up many opportunities for them that they didn't have before. But they, are, they know it's not just about the broadband that it brings. It's about the people who will be engaged around it and, and use the broadband in a way that, that helps to engage not only their community members, but also attract investment and retain that investment. There are many other examples. Uh, nearby in Ohio, we have a number of communities that are evolving. Uh, one of the ways that we see that, that growth is through a, 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 the ICF Institute out of uh, Dublin, Ohio. Uh, they've been working for about a decade now, trying to encourage some of the local communities to become involved. 
uh, Hudson, a small community in, in central Ohio, didn't know that it had the capabilities to be not only a smart city, but one of the top seven communities. Uh, we have other examples. Uh, we have here Robert Wilkes from, uh, from Sarnia, Lambton, and Ontario. Uh, they went through a process of discovering uh, that they too were not only a smart city, but then grew to become an intelligent community. Uh, I would think that there are a lot of communities in Minnesota that could go through that process. We could then help <coughs> them identify those things that are gaps for themselves, that they are then able to either make a decision around fixing them or you know, at least they're knowing what, what the gaps are and how they, how they should proceed. One of our big cities, Toronto, is currently going through a really big transformation. Uh, they invited through an RFP company, Alphabet, Google, Cyborg Labs, uh, to come to their community and change the, the nature of what their waterfront's about. They actually invited them to say, okay, come on in and, and show what you can do with your technology. And then you can take it away and, and, and showcase it around the world. In that process, the community learned that it really was unsure that it wanted all that technology in their community. They were looking at the issues of privacy, at the ethics side. Remember I showed you the trends and how privacy and data are going to become a key area of discussion. That has now not only created a pushback to some fantastic designs and fantastic urban uh, development opportunities to the point where this month they'll know whether Google wants to leave or not. It'll be another issue of like Amazon in New York. Uh, maybe they don't want it. I would like to see them actually go ahead and and see if they could work with it so that we can try to learn how we can work with issues around privacy. There are things called civic trusts or urban trusts around how ethical, transparent, open uh, data can be useful in a community and how a, a community can begin to develop trust around some of these big tech companies coming in and using the, the data that, that, that's generated. One way is transactional. You know, you want to be part of this, you want to be part of the community, well then maybe you should pay the people for the data that they're giving you, as opposed to just taking it and, and uh, just using it. So there are some lessons to be learned out of this particular example. In a community, and primarily in some of the smaller communities, they're asking, well, how do you get started? How do we even begin to engage our community? How do we even start to make applications? Uh, we don't have the expertise in a local community, or maybe they just haven't discovered the people who are able to make application and so forth. And so we have started a whole series of documents uh, that are available on our website that begin to teach communities how to get engaged, how to start, how to be empowered. What's the value of broadband and so forth? And so. Uh, we ask them to not be afraid to make an application. Make the application, it doesn't cost you anything, and at the end of the day, we'll tell you what your gaps are. And if you're willing to accept the fact that you will have gaps, and how you can fix those gaps, well then we're there to help you. We're there to take you to the next level. And as I say, there are lots of benefits. We've written documents that says, you know, we have over 20, 20 benefits that you will receive, and probably the number one benefit that communities want, they want that free earned media. They want to be told around the world, world that they're one of the smart cities of the world. Why? They want to engage people to come and be part of their community. They want to attract foreign direct investment, and they also want to keep the people in their communities because, heck, if we're doing really well, we should stay here and be part of the journey. We're offering to you a whole host of things, uh, mostly free. If you go to our website, uh, there are documents that uh, will show you how to get started. We have a new one coming out next month. We call it Investment Ready Abbotsford, one of the communities that we've helped along the way. We've shown them that they are, in fact, a smart city, and we took them through a whole year process, and we documented it, and, and it shows uh, you know, basically how you can, as a community, get yourselves ready for uh, 
uh, investment attraction and retention. I also have uh, two books here that I'm uh, willing to hand out. Uh, one's on broadband economics and uh, another one is called Brain Game, dealing with uh, the attraction and retention of talent in the community. So uh, the first uh, uh, four people that uh, approach me with their business card, I uh, will give you uh, uh, a copy of the book. Um, and some of the other documents that, and videos and, and other material basically on our website. We have a, a conference coming up uh, in Rochester, New York, closer than Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're welcome to attend. We will be announcing the next 21 smart cities in the world uh, at the conference. And we'll, of course, uh, uh, have, it's a three-day conference which includes a tour of Rochester. And then in February, uh, in Taoyuan, Taiwan, our current Intelligent Community of the Year, uh, we will have a, um, another conference uh, with the top seven announced, but we're also doing another special project in that community. After they've won, they invited us to come back and bring experts from around the world to help them develop the next smart city adjacent to Taoyuan, which will be called the Intelligent Aerotropolis, basically the smart city of their airport area in Taiwan. And then finally, back in this part of the world, in Dublin, Ohio, uh, we are going to have our next year's summit. And the focus is going to be on small communities and how those small communities can contribute based on the smart infrastructure we were talking about and the strategies that we also talked about today. So I thank you for your time. I hope uh, this is useful and there were some takeaways for you today. Bernadine, thank you. Questions? John, can you talk a little bit about the leadership requirement and opportunities for local elected officials in particular to lead these challenges? So I, I, I gave you a couple of examples. For instance, the mayor of uh, Stratford, Ontario, when, uh, when they were looking for ways to uh, engage their community as a year-round economic development, Community for people to be attracted to them or you know, to develop at the local level. He was able to, uh, to work from examples that we've already begin, began to develop. And those examples that he took home uh, helped to convince a local community that they needed to go to the next stage. And without having the kinds of champions like Dan Matheson or uh, we have Robert Wilkes here from Sarnia, the, the community involved in creating their intelligent uh, community in Sarnia, and others, these things wouldn't happen. Uh, in Hudson, they hired an economic development person who then channeled the forces around uh, creating their intelligent uh, Ohio entry. And Hudson, out of the blue, uh, were able to figure out uh, those uh, elements in their community that made them smart community and then took it to another level to learn how to become an intelligent community. And bringing all of those forces together requires some kind of champion. Uh, leadership is, is a key element and is one of the things that we, we obviously mark as part of uh, the adjudicator's response to the uh, community applications. Please go ahead, Anna. Hi, I'm Anna Brown. I had a question, uh, just a corollary to this. Does, is it ever the case where the leadership is more of a ground up versus a top down? And if so, what's the catalyst? What brings it? <laughs> well, in different parts of the world, it's, uh, it comes from a different perspective. So uh, in China, a place like Taiwan, it's more top down. Uh, and so the mayor of Taipei had issues. Uh, those issues, uh, congestion, Solution and other things needed some solutions and they saw our program as a way of communicating those things to their community and from a top-down uh, they may
made recommendations that people should be doing certain things. And uh, when they won the Intelligent Community of the Year back in, uh, I guess, uh, 2005 or 2006, it kind of raised the awareness in Taiwan that this is an important way to, to go. Fortunately, he became president of Taiwan and took those same ideas and then said, everybody should be doing this. And so we have something like 20 odd cities alone in the island of Taiwan that have uh, become intelligent communities. And we recognize, I think, 14 of them at the highest levels. It started with a top down champion. Uh, in terms of the Stratford example, uh, he brought the idea to them, but it was really from the bottom up. Everybody's saying, yeah, we really need to do this. And it was that intelligent Stratford movement that really pushed it. Of course, he was a champion for it, but it required that empowerment and that engagement at the local level. And there are most of the communities that we deal with, other than, I think, the, the Chinese examples, uh, tend to be from the bottom up. Uh, we see a number of cities, uh, and I've written books and, and papers on utopian cities and mega cities and so forth. And the ones that don't work, in my view, uh, Songdo in South Korea, uh, in the Incheon area of um, Seoul, totally from the top down. Uh, an idea of a particular technology-focused uh, entrepreneur, and the development of that city is a failure. Uh, there are other examples, Mazdar City, and, area. Uh, again, from the top down, doesn't seem to work. So we see a sense of bringing the community together and ensuring that there's buy-in and methodologies behind it that support it. That, that, that is really an essential part of the ingredient. That's why this whole concept of ethical, fair, and open cities is becoming a huge component of the whole sort of smart cities and intelligent community movement. Thank you. Thank you, you know, from Lennon Foundation's perspective, what we've really appreciated about the framework is that it gives you a kind of a holistic way to understand all of the elements involved. Uh, we have um, our new commissioner, D, Steve Grove, is really interested in innovation and workforce. And we know that a lot in Lennon Foundation cares so much about equity and digital inclusion. And what's so beautiful about the framework is that it, it, it's a way to understand that all of those elements are key. It's not just the infrastructure, it's, it's how you use it and how you approach it. So um, are there any other final comments or questions done? Please. started to do work uh, in you know, Canada, the United States, and, and abroad, I started to realize that uh, there was more to it than just uh, the technology aspects. When I joined the uh, World Teleport Association, the World Trade Centers, um, they opened the door for me to start to see what was going on in other parts of the world, and particularly in places like uh, in Japan and uh, other parts of Asia where they were taking huge scientific approaches to their cities, I just realized, you know, there was a need for the people side to this whole equation. So when we started the Smart Cities direction in Canada, uh, I'm originally from the U.S., but moved to Canada, I saw the need for the people side to be developed. And I engaged my partners that I, that I used to hire as staff as part of the World Trade Centers Association came with me and uh, we uh, developed ideas and put out our first paper that said it's not just about technology, it's about people and how the community transformation has other elements to it and we use the word holistic as the approach.
approach that we needed to take. And that uh, image, that virtuous cycle uh, from smart infrastructure all the way to advocacy always has changed words and, and, and meanings, but has been consistent since the 1980s. And that's one of the benefits. We're able to go back a long way with our data to, to make those comparisons. But for me, it was a personal uh, movement. Uh, like Doctors Without Borders, I didn't want to see this as a business. I could have gone into consulting alone for it, but what we decided to do was we wanted to open it up, uh, make it available to any community. Uh, we said we would not charge because we wanted to make sure that they saw that any data that we were taking advantage of with bringing back to the community benefits and sharing that information uh, globally. So that was our hook, that we were uh, nonpartisan, uh, a community-focused uh, group, and uh, that we were going to share as opposed to charge. And I think that was the turning point for us, that we started to see communities respond to that. And while all of our people that work with us around the world have their own jobs and Activities, most of them give back to us. They pay forward by getting involved as either adjudicators or uh, sharing some of these solutions to these major disruptions, uh, and that's very important as part of the process. John, is that Kelly Wilkes from Lamberton and her father? Um, we're so uh, Kelly is uh, here uh, representing an intelligent community. Uh, top seven from Canada, and she'll be speaking tonight at a panel of digital natives to talk about their perspectives on life and work. So thank you, John, for connecting us to Kelly and her father. So please join me in thanking John Young for that wonderful presentation. Thank you, John. Well, Mary tells me that our buffet lunch